Hello. Today we're here in London Soho, next to the hubbub of Chinatown. So it's a great setting to explore China's cultural imprint on this city, but indeed on the world stage as well, because London is proudly one of the most diverse metropolises in the world. And speaking of、um, the impact of China, perhaps Made in China springs to mind very naturally. Along with its food culture, which is also a great export of China, and we have a time-honored adage that says, "Food is the people's religion," especially true around about now <laughs> near lunchtime, right? <laughs> so, food and wine tend to go together, hand in hand, and it's certainly true that the Chinese wine culture is just as vibrant and diverse as its food culture. So, if I tell you that China has been making wine for thousands of years, and that the world's most valuable alcohol companies are Chinese, wouldn't you be curious、um, why you know alcohol is not really a Chinese major export, right? But before we discuss that point, let me first discuss about this label, Made in China, because Made in China. For the last 40 years or so, has been an epoch-defining phenomenon of industrialization, of globalization, but mainly associated with mass-produced goods. But if we cast our eyes further back into history, China's business card could say something like "Purveyor of Oriental Wonders," you know, of fine porcelain, of fine silks, and tea. In fact, it's the British tradition, the Great British tradition of making a cup of tea, that was a key driver that dragged an introspective China onto the global stage and into world trade. And so, around the 1800s,、uh, Chinese、uh, sailors, Chinese peddlers, began to arrive in Britain on British merchant ships initially. And the everlasting legacy of these early settlers was the food culture from home. Liverpool and Limehouse in London's East End actually lay claim to the oldest Chinese communities in Western Europe. But Soho's prominence, Chinatown in Soho, really started in the post-war era of the 1950s, because during the Second World War, the east end of London suffered severe bomb damages, and、um, Soho became quite attractive because of its great nightlife and cheap commercial rents. So the business-minded Chinese people decided to、uh, build their eateries around this area, and by this time. British servicemen were also returning from the Far East with a taste for Chinese food, and soon the British public also embraced Chinese cuisine too, although a slightly altered version of it. <laughs> But why is wine missing from this culinary and immigration story, despite its historical and cultural importance? Well, for one thing. The British licensing law would have been way too daunting for first-generation Chinese immigrants. But also,、um, Chinese wine until the modern era was quite a local and artisanal product. <coughs> so, it's <coughs> sorry the 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 shipping and、uh, storing and also producing wine is a very complex business, and it's very risky as well. Whereas cooking with locally sourced ingredients、uh, are much more easily、uh, doable, and involves less risk if you are setting up shop in a brand new foreign land. And now, after a time, the second and third generations of Chinese restaurateurs, they've gotten used to、uh, running successful Chinese restaurants without relying on the sales of alcoholic beverages, and have all but lost that connection with Chinese wine. But this is set to change, because Chinese wine—and here I do mean wines made with 
grapes uh, in the familiar European style, not just liquors, grain liquors or Chinese rice wine. They are making inroads on the international stage. The modern Chinese wine industry has been quietly growing for the last 30 years or so, but now it's consistently making internationally award-winning wines. And the watershed moment came in 2012, when a Chinese wine won the top international wine award, the Decanter World Wine Award here in London. This wine competi uh, this competition is done by blind tasting by expert judges, and no one expected that the winner would have come from China. So since then, people have started to take notice of this emergence of the Chinese wine industry. And Chinese wines have been delighting and surprising wine lovers around the world, especially at blind tastings. I suggest you try it for yourself. Next time, if you have a dinner party, take a bottle of Chinese wine and ask people to guess where it's from. I'm sure people will remember and talk about your wine for a long time. And with the availability of more uh, high quality Chinese wines, some of the London top Chinese restaurants have started to list them, sometimes even creating wine and food pairing menus. And this trend is sure to continue. Just like lots of uh, Japanese restaurants and Korean restaurants, they would proudly have a selection of sake or soju. I reckon in the not too distant future, more Chinese restaurants will also be offering quality Chinese wines. And I think customers would also expect just as much. But what is different about Chinese wine to most of the other made in China products? Well, the good news for other wine regions is that the bulk wines from China will not be flooding the international wine market. And that is because their main interest is in the domestic wine market, which is huge. And that's also one of the reasons why wine is not a major export, because most wines are consumed domestically. The more exciting wines from China that will be gracing the international stage will be from the fine wine sector. And by their nature, they are relatively low volume productions and are niche products. By the way, it's no coincidence that a fine wine sector would emerge in China with its economic rise. So these wines, premium wines, fine wines from China, they are made in the artisanal ways to showcase the unique terrain or soil or climate conditions of various parts of China and uh, their influence on both the familiar and the exotic wine grape varieties. So familiar grapes such as Cabernet Sauvignon, is the most planted variety in China. In fact, China plants more Cabernet Sauvignon than anywhere else in the world. More exotic grapes include Longyan, which is dragon eye, and it makes a fresh and minerally white wine. And also of note is a variety called Marcelin. It's a previously obscure French variety that has found great expressions in China. Chinese Marcelin is capable of showing fresh and juicy and red fruit characters with a silky texture, which appeal to a palate that prefers balance and um, smoothness. So watch out for Chinese Marcelin. It might become a star variety, just like how Malbec has taken to Argentina and Sauvignon Blanc in New Zealand. So these are old world wine grapes finding fame in new wine regions. So Marcelin, look out for it. But why do I think Chinese wine is important to the point that I'm here? really eager to share this story with you. And it's because I think in our time of global connectedness, wine is a great cultural ambassador that really brings people from different backgrounds together. And through this sharing of experience, we can gain deeper insights into other cultures. So wine inspires the desire to travel and to learn about new places 
and to learn about people and their customs and the way of their lives. And wine makers and wine drinkers alike, through this shared interest, shared passion in wine, they could intuitively understand very subtle and new cultural concepts. For example, the French word tiroir and the Chinese word feng tu. They don't easily translate into other languages, but both of these terms relate to a sense of somewhereness, you know, a somewhereness that you can feel when you're tasting wine, because wine is very particular to a place. It's very particular to climatic or geographic conditions. So through this language of wine, we can understand tiroir or feng tu or somewhereness. You know, so wine gives us a shared language to understand other concepts. And let me leave you with one more thought, and that is the Chinese wine industry is really a microcosm of greater themes which are important in China today. For example, most of the wine regions in China are based in uh, traditionally infertile lands where soil um, erosion and desertification were occurring at alarming rates. So planting vineyard is a good solution to soil erosion. And related to this, most of these traditionally infertile regions were also the poorest parts of China. So you could say these are the left behind parts of China, you know, that didn't benefit from the Chinese economic miracle of the last 40 years. But the wine industry is breathing new leases of life in these regions. Infrastructure has been put in place to support the wine and the wine tourism industries and local jobs have been created for local people. A case in point would be Ningxia province, which is near the Gobi Desert, but now a thriving wine region. So indeed, the climate challenge and the leveling up agenda, they're truly global imperatives. And so I hope you will seek out and look out for some Chinese wines to try. And I hope you will take an interest in this fledgling international wine phenomenon. And I also hope that you will reconsider the notion of what made in China could mean in the future. And ultimately, I think it's to approach a different culture, to approach it and to feel for it, like how a true wine lover would appraise a wine. And that is to engage all the sensory faculties and to be observant and inquisitive of details and nuances and to use the head and the heart. Thank you.